Today we're going to talk about and study what is the washing of the water by the word. And why do we need it? And how do we, in our prayers, ask God to help us? Because it's a very important thing. Let's come to Ephesians, the fifth chapter, and let's see the one place where Paul writes about the washing of the water of the word. And then we'll put some other scriptures together and understand what he's talking about here, okay? Let's pick it up in verse 25. Ephesians 5, verse 25. It reads, Husbands, love your wives in the same way that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, so that he might sanctify it. Now, sanctify means to make holy. Having cleansed it. Cleansed it from what? Cleansed it with the washing of the water by the word. Now when we read this, this is a process. It's not just something that happens once. Because cleanse it is present tense. And with the washing of the water of the word, now notice what it's to do. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself as the glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blame. Now that's the whole process that Christ is using to perfect the church. Now, let's come back here to Ephesians, the first chapter. Let's see how this ties in with the first part of it. Okay? To see what he is doing with us so that we can be holy and without blame. Let's pick it up here in verse 3, Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, in the heavenly things. Now, some people seem to think that means that we go to heaven or something like that. No, but the things that help us in conversion, God's Spirit, the Word of God, these are heavenly things sent to the earth in the heavenly things with Christ, according as he has personally chosen us for himself before the foundation of the world in order that we might be holy and blameless before him in love. So what is this going to do? How does this operation work? All right, let's read verse 5 and see what it's destined to do having predestinated us for sonship to himself through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. So let's ask the question, what is the washing of the water by the word? Let's come to Gospel of John chapter 4. And here we find the first instance where Jesus talks about living water. And we will see that the living water has to do with the Holy Spirit. So the washing of the water by the word then has to do with the Holy Spirit. And then we will see that confirmed in John 7 here in just a minute. Okay. John 4, let's pick it up in verse 9. John 4 and verse 9. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, to give you water to drink? For the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. They weren't to associate with any Gentiles, see. That was a tradition of the Jews, not a law of God. Jesus answered and said to her, If you had known the gift of God, now what is the gift of God? The Spirit of God. And who it is that said to you, give me some water to drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living waters. 
Now, where else do we find living waters? Where else is that mentioned? Now, we'll get to John 7 in just a minute, besides John 7. Where where else is that mentioned? Book of Revelation. What comes out from underneath the throne of God? Living waters, crystal clear. Okay? Okay? So that has to do with the supply of the Holy Spirit. And then she didn't understand that, and she said, how then do you have the living water? Well, let's come over to John chapter 7, and let's see how it is explained here in John 7. And let's pick it up here in verse 37. Now, you've heard this said before, too. Now, we'll come back and we'll see it in John the 6th chapter, that it's combined with something else. So let's pick it up here, verse 37, John 7. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and called out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, we'll see that has to do with the washing of the water of the word. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, which those who believed in him would soon receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, there we have it, see. All right. If any man thirst... Now, this is a way of explaining that human beings were made incomplete and needing the Holy Spirit of God and needing the righteousness of God to fulfill their purpose in life. And we'll see how Jesus explains it back here in uh, John, the sixth chapter. Let's pick it up here in verse 35, just a page back. John 6 and verse 35. And we also have to understand that this comes through Christ. And this is the part of the Holy Spirit of God, which is called the Spirit of Christ, and it is to do something for us. This has nothing to do with baptism. Baptism is the start of the covenant relationship between you and God. This has to do with something else that that involves overcoming and involves overcoming in our minds and in our hearts having our minds and hearts changed all right let's see what jesus said here verse 35 jesus said to them i am the bread of life the one who comes to me shall never hunger and the one who believes in me shall never thirst at any time Meaning this, that if you, are, if you are baptized and receive the Holy Spirit of God, you are believing in Christ at all times, and therefore the Holy Spirit will satisfy the purpose of your life. And without the Holy Spirit, you're never going to know the purpose of life. You're never going to be satisfied in what you're doing. That's why people say, You know, like it says in the Proverbs, well, a fool's delight is to discover himself. (laughs) And how many people out there, especially the hippies, they come along and they say, hey, what are you doing? Well, man, I'm finding myself. Well, were you lost? You know, where where did you go? Uh, How do you find yourself, see? And all of these things are motivated because God made us incomplete needing the Spirit of God. So, If we do, then we will notice there's another aspect tied to it, see? He shall never hunger, and the one who believes in me shall never thirst at any time. Now notice. Notice how he explained it here. Okay? Let's follow along here in the verses and see what he did. Okay? Now, here's how Jesus explained it. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Now, the bread of life combined with the living waters then is what converts you. Verse 49, your fathers ate manna in the desert, but they died. 
This is the bread which comes down from heaven, so that any one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any one eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is even my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And I couldn't understand that. I couldn't understand about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And how does that fill in with the living waters? Well, you first have to repent and be baptized. That puts you in covenant with God. Then you receive the Holy Spirit. So now you have Christ, who is the living bread. And also, through the renewal of the covenant with the unleavened bread and wine, then we receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is to come to us spiritually just as water, to wash, to cleanse, to heal. And we'll see how that does here. Let's come down and finish off this section. Let's come down here to uh, verse 53. Therefore Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Now, when we get to the Passover time, we know that Jesus broke the bread and said, Here, take this, eat. This is my flesh, which is broken for you. Then he took the wine, and he said, All of you drink of it. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of sin. And that shows that you cannot have a relationship with Christ unless that is done that way, exactly as the scriptures show. Now, for many years, I haven't given detailed sermons concerning the Passover and so forth, but this year I'm going to, because there's a lot there. And What I'll have to do is also I'll have to show you the first edition of the Passover book was about like this, then the second edition of the Passover book, which is like this, then the third edition of the Passover book, which is like this, and like someone said, how could something so simple require so many pages? (laughs) Well, the truth is, because it is so simple and so meaningful, Satan the devil has many counterfeits to try and keep the the true Christians out of covenant with God. Because if you get out of covenant with God, you can lose your salvation. So therefore, there are so many things that come along to try and destroy that relationship. Okay, now let's see what he said. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Of course, they were wondering, now, how can this be? Now, these were dis- disciples who were following him. See? Not all the disciples, and a disciple means a learner. Not all the disciples who followed him believed him. You, you read uh, chapter 8. We've gone through that before. See? They didn't believe in him. Okay. Verse 54, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is truly food, and my blood is truly drink. Well, imagine after Christ got done repeating this and repeating this and repeating this, (laughs) that they were beside themselves. What is he saying and doing? See, because after that, those disciples that didn't believe, they were offended and left. So much so that uh, only the twelve were there, and Jesus said to them, Are you going to go? Verse 56, The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood is dwelling in me, and I in him. So the Holy Spirit and the washing of the water of the word and Christ in us all tie together as we will see. Now here's the whole lesson of it. Verse 57, As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so also the one who eats me shall live by me. 
means by all the words that he he taught, the message that he brought, how he inspired the apostles to write what they wrote, we shall live by him. All right. Now, let's come to John 15 and see something else. John 15. Let's pick it up here in verse 1. Now, here we see that the Father is also involved in it. Because the Holy Spirit, as we have seen, has two aspects. Number one, the begettle from the Father. Number two, the Spirit of Christ, which gives us the mind of Christ. And then both of these, we will see, work together with the washing of the water by the word. Now notice what he says here beginning in verse 1, John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit, but he cleanses each one. How does he cleanse each one that bears fruit in order that it may bear more fruit? Now notice carefully, you are already clean through the word that I have spoken, the washing of the water by the word. Then he explains very clearly here, we'll finish with verse 4 so that we can put this all together now here. Dwell in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but only if it remains in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you are dwelling in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, the one who is dwelling in me and I in him bears much fruit because apart from me you can do nothing. That's why there has to be conversion. And the washing of the water of the word cannot take place until there first is, as we will see, repentance, baptism, which is the circumcision of the heart, then the Holy Spirit can be given. Now, once we have that, we need to grow in grace and knowledge, grow in understanding, and all of these things combine together, and that's the process of conversion that we have by living God's way. And the washing of the water by the word becomes very important. All right, now let's look at the opposite of this. Let's come to James, James the first chapter, and let's see where it talks about unstable water of those who are unconverted. James the first chapter. Yeah. Okay, verse 1. Okay. Now, let's pick it up here in verse 6. Chapter 1, verse 6. This is about praying and asking for wisdom and so forth and having endurance. But let him ask in faith, not doubting at all, because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea that is driven by the wind and tossed to and fro. That's the way of the world. And who is the prince of the power of the air, which sweeps people along? Satan, the devil. Do not let that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That's another reason why we need, or the very first reason why we need the washing of the water of the word. To increase the faith, to change our thinking, and we will see Changing our thinking and cleansing our minds is the whole total purpose of conversion. And it takes the washing of the water of the word to do that. Let's see what James says to the double-minded. Let's come back here to chapter 4. Let's see what happens when you're double-minded. Chapter 4, verse 1. And we can equate this to as the things that we covered concerning the church wars. Okay? Verse 1. What is the cause of quarrels and fighting among you? (laughs) Is it not mainly from your own lust that are warring within your members? Then we'll see, that's double-minded. You want to follow God, but then you let your lust rule. 
and you're like the waves of the sea, tossed back and forth, see. You lust and have not, you kill and are jealous, you're not able to obtain, you fight and quarrel, but still you do not have because you do not ask. And what happens when they hear that? Oh, you're not asking. Oh, well, then I'll ask. Then he says, verse 3, then you ask, and you do not receive because you ask with evil motives. And that means also unrepentant, because we will see what the washing of the water is to do internally with us through repentance, beginning with repentance, with evil motives that you may consume it on your own lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that French, the friendship of the world is enmity with God? See? One foot in the world, one foot in the church. Therefore, whoever desires to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now notice what's taking place inside. This is the reason we need the washing of the water of the word. Or, verse 5, or do you think that the scriptures say in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts with envy? Because we're going to see the washing of the water of the word is the answer to overcoming lusts that pull you down, sin that still dwells in the mind, bad experiences of the past that still haunt you. That's what the washing of the water of the word is, you see. But you see, it starts with human nature. And the lust that dwells in there, that's what we need to get rid of. But he gives greater grace. This is the reason it says, God sets himself against the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And humbling means repenting and yielding to God. Okay? Therefore, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you, because he's the prince of the power of the air, giving you double-mindedness, so that you're unstable like water. One way one day, one way another another day, can even change in, sometimes in minutes. Okay? Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So how do we purify our hearts? Well, it has to do with the washing of the water of the word. Now, notice the word cleanse so many times that we've already covered, you see. You are cleansed by the word that Jesus is spoken. That's the cleansing by the water of the word. Now, let's see how that requires Repentance. All right, let's come to Psalm. Let's come to Psalm 51. We're back here in the book of Psalms, Psalm 51. Now here is a great psalm which helps us understand real repentance, how we are to yield to God, how we are to be completely brokenhearted when we sin and do things that are not right, And we ask God for forgiveness and notice what he says. Because this ties right in with the washing of the water of the word. Now this was after David had committed his sin with Bathsheba. And here's his repentance. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgression. Now, this is a model of prayer for repentance. Now, especially if you have committed a real bad one, like David did, see. You wouldn't expect that David would have done anything like this when you consider how he started. So he was really repenting. He says, blot out my transgressions, because there were many. What did he do? He shouldn't have had the affair in the first place. He shouldn't have sent a servant over there to invite her over to to his place. She should not have been bathing up on the roof where she knew the king would walk in the evening. 
she should not have accepted the invitation, then they should not have had the affair, and then he tried to cover it up. So you see, when you start sinning, what happens? You drift further and further from God. And when you try and work it out yourself without repentance, it doesn't work. It only gets more complicated. Only becomes more trouble. So then he said, oh, well, I'll solve the problem. You know, I'm the king. I'm the commander in chief. I'll I'll get the general Joab up here and we'll work out a deal. I'll tell him to, you know, send send Uriah the Hittite here, and I'll I'll get him to uh, go sleep with his wife. Well, he wasn't quite so stupid, because he knew where his house was, and he knew where Bathsheba bathed, and he knew where the king walked, and why would the king reach clear down into uh, the lower ranks and ask for Uriah the Hittite to come home eat with the king, and then the king say, oh, well, go have some pleasure with your wife. And he said, no, my lord, if I'm not there fighting with my men, I'm not going to go with my wife. So he didn't do it. That makes you wonder what he suspected, see. So now David was really in a pickle. So he he tried to convince him the next night and give him a whole much more wine so he'd be kind of half-looped and, you know, and really want to go home and have an affair with his wife like he should. So, no, my Lord, I can't do it. So then again, he called Joab and said, Joab, now when you're in the thick of the battle against the Amorites, I, I want you, when Uriah the Hittite is right up there with all the opposition, want you to back away. Let him die. Well, Joab remembered that. Imagine what the general would think. So this, where he says here, blot out all my transgressions. He had multiple transgressions and planning. And he still didn't come to his senses until God sent Nathan the prophet. And he still didn't understand it until Nathan the prophet said, after giving the parable of the of the poor man with a little ewe lamb that was stolen. And then David said, Well, that man should be really punished. And then Nathan said, You, you are the man. Then he re- related what he did with Bathsheba and so forth. Okay. Now notice his approach. That's why you hear sin explained this way, dirty, right? Because it is. So David said, verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That had to be washed away internally as well as removed from the book of life, washing by the water of the word. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me, right there in the forefront of his mind. Have you ever had it that way? You just can't get rid of it, or you have an experience that you just can't stop remembering and reliving? That's why you need the washing of the water of the word. Think of all the things that he had to have cleansed out of his mind. All the deviousness to work out all these details to try and get it done. The using of an innocent man, Joab, his general, to come and have that man killed. Sounds a little like the mafia, doesn't it, huh? But just because he's king and has all power, that makes it even worse. So David, in his repentance, really understood. He said, against you, you only, have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may might be justified when you speak and be right when in the right when you judge. God's judgment was right. What was the everlasting punishment that David had, even though God forgave him his sin? Because it was so grievous. 
He said, you're going to have trouble in your household all the rest of your life. And you read the life of David after that. You had the incident with with um, uh, Absalom and Tamar. And then you had all of the other wives that David had. Other men took them that very day in the sight of this son. And then the rebellion by Absalom. And it got so bad that when the rebellion was going on and the kingdom was split because of Absalom wanting to take over being king and nothing but trouble and confusion. And David was so afraid that he, he was leaving the palace with some of his troops and things like that. And, and a man was coming along and he just, he just cursed him, shook his fist at him. You know, you brought all of this upon us, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and Joab said, you want me to do him in? He said, no, nah, leave him alone. He's speaking the truth. <laughs> so he finally learned a lesson, see. God is right. So then he admits this. He admits human nature. This is what we have to understand, see. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Was David born of an adulterous affair? No. We are born with the law of sin and death within us. And unless we have the Spirit of God to have the washing of the water of the Word, and to have our hearts and minds converted, we are going to go back and do just like David and revert back to the lusts of the law of sin and death within us and then think we're justified in doing it, see. So this is really a deep repentance here. Behold, now here is the whole purpose of the cleansing and washing the water of the word. Behold, you desire truth in the inward part. Now, what is it said of human nature? The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Is that not what happened with David in this affair? Was he not deceitful in it? Was he not desperately wicked in what he was doing? Yes, indeed. Watch the truth in the inward part. So we have to ask ourselves a question. How much... How much truth do we have? We can put it another way. How much are we willing to let the spirit of the truth, which is the washing of the water by the word, to convert our minds and actually change the way that we think with the truth of God? Because that's what it's all about. That's how we are converted. That's how we come to have the mind of Christ. So God is really performing a miracle in us. He's taking us with this deceitful mind, leading us to repentance, granting us his Holy Spirit, having us grow and overcome, and giving his His Spirit to us so we can change from deceitful to truthful, from carnal to holy. And all of those things are part of the washing of the water by the Word. Now notice... What else he says here? And in the hidden part, or the secret part, the secret recesses of the mind also have to be converted and changed, you see? You can't say, God, I love you, and then in a secret part of your mind still hold hatred for people, still hold grudges against people, still relive, relive sins of the past, You have to have all of that washed out. See? And in the hidden part, you shall make me to know wisdom. Now, along with this washing, notice he gets a little scrubbing with it too. Purge me with hyssop. Now, what is hyssop? Hyssop is like a scouring pad. Did he have a lot of dirt and (laughs) sinful things on his in his relationship with God, and in his mind, so to speak, yes. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Okay. The question was asked, when did David receive the Holy Spirit? Well, when he was anointed to be king. See? So here he gave in to the pulls of the flesh. 
after years and years and years. And also after God gave the blessing and the promise. Because David's heart was tender before he did this. And he was sitting in his house playing on his ten-string instrument. And he said, oh God, I'm in this house build a cedar and you have no place to live. Let me build a house for you. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Then Nathan the prophet came and said, Yes, do all that's in your heart, but you will not build it but your son, because you're a bloody man. But he had the blessing of doing all the plans and all, you know, saving all the money and everything to build it. See? Okay. Let's go here. Now notice verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. That's how crushed he was. His bones weren't broken, but felt as though he was broken. Mm -hmm. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create. Now notice that. This is what has to be done. That's why the washing of the water of the word, because it cleanses, it helps, it creates, and with the you, you need the Holy Spirit plus the Word of God, which gets back to two things you've heard how many times? Prayer and study, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So it wasn't like, you know, double-minded and like the waves of the ocean. Cast me not from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. So how close was he to really being, you know, right on the edge? Very close. Very close indeed. All right. Now, before we go any further, let's go ahead and we'll take a little break. 